You can go now. Okay, I'm gonna try. Oh, Good right. afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to another one of our sessions. Today, I have the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Paul K. Matsuda, who is going to address us today with his presentation. Dr. Matsuda is professor of English and director of second language writing at Arizona State University, where he works closely with doctoral students specializing in second language writing from various disciplinary perspectives. Dr. Matsuda is founding chair of the symposium on second language writing and series editor of the Parlor Press series on second language writing. He's a former president of the American Association of Applied Linguistics, and he has also served as the founding chair of the CCCC Committee on Second Language Writing and the chair of the Non-Native English Speakers in TESOL, N-N-E-S-T, at TESOL International Association. Dr. Matsuda has published, published widely in applied linguistics, writing studies, and TESOL and he has received a number of prestigious awards for his publications. He uses a di diverse array or theoretical and methodological tools to investigate topics <clears throat> such as disciplinary history, identity in written discourse, professional development, writing for publication, writing and language assessment, teaching and learning, and writing program administration. Uh, definitely, I can say that he is an icon in education globally, and I'm so honored to attend one of his presentations. So with you, Dr. Paul K. Matsuda. Right. Thank you, Tomas, for your wonderful introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Buenas tardes. Um, so today I'm going to talk about teaching writing at the university level. Uh, that was the topic that was given to me, actually. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is applicable at any level. And I'm also going to approach this at the broader philosophical level. Um, in, instead of talking about what to do or how so much, I'm going to talk more about why we do what we do. And that would help us uh, develop an attitude, awareness, and strategies that allow us to develop appropriate pedagogical solutions for any given situation that you might encounter. And if you have specific questions that you'd like me to address, uh, I hope to have enough time at the end of the session to address your questions and engage in discussion about teaching. Okay. So, I want to start with the question of what is writing? Because when we are trying to teach something, we need to know what it is that we are trying to teach. And how we define writing or how we conceptualize writing is going to have a significant impact on how we design our curriculum and what students end up learning. Historically, writing was conceptualized as mere transcription of speech. That was the 19th century and early 20th century view of writing. And once people started, um, so, so some of the linguists uh, in the early 20th century, structural linguists, even surmised that writing is a hindrance to learning speech because speech is continuing to evolve, but writing doesn't so much. And there's a gap between what we actually say and what we write down in the form of written language. And then in the 1960s, we realized that speech is just as uh, secondary to language use as the grammatical competence that we have in our head. Um, so some people started to see writing as a manifestation of grammatical competence. But later, we realized that it's, writing is not just about grammar, but there is a whole lot more considerations social linguistic competence, pragmatic competence, discourse competence, and audience awareness, rhetorical competence. Um, and we, we need to develop all of these in order to approach writing, the task of writing, as well as the teaching of writing appropriately. 
And in the 1960s, uh, there was a moment when uh, many teachers were interested in using writing as a means for personal exploration and expression. Now, these can be generative. Uh, when you are trying to generate ideas, we can use writing to mediate our thinking process. And also writing can be a way of expressing ourselves, you know, artistic writing uh, or just to vent our frustrations, right? Uh, so writing can be used that way, but that's not the only reason for writing. And in the, the 80s and 90s, the emphasis was on communication, which is appropriate, probably better than previous approaches. But if you only see writing as the tool for communication, we are also neglecting a more significant function of writing which is how we create meaning in the process of writing and how we create meaning socially through communication. So a broader uh, and more um, encompassing conception of writing might be to see it as one of the semiotic resources, that is resources for meaning making, just like sound and other visual elements. Now, these days, um, many people are interested in multimodal composition. That is, we communicate not just with, with words, not just with sounds, not just with letters, but we communicate with lots of different things. When I'm speaking, I'm using gestures, right? And my background, my PowerPoint design, all of these communicate something. And it contributes to the overall experience and the meaning that's created in our communication. So writing is one of those resources that allow us to create meaning, both individually and also socially. And it's also important to consider why we teach writing. In many classrooms, writing is being taught in the form of test preparation in order for students to pass the test or get certain scores uh, to get into college, graduate school, uh, or simply to pass the course. And of course, that approach is relatively limited in terms of how it can prepare students for doing other things. And sometimes we teach writing as a preparation for courses across the disciplines. In when students are taking science courses, they will need to learn about the science and they may need to report on what they have done in the lab, or they may need to um, demonstrate what they know through writing and written exams, report writing and so on. And also writing can be a way of facilitating learning. We remember things better when we write things down and see them visually. That allows us to um, refresh our memory, commit something to memory, uh, and also organize memory um, and uh, our thinking. And it also allows us to see what we don't know. When we, are, when, we, we, when we are just reflecting, we might think that we understand a concept, but when we try to put it together in the form of writing, sometimes we realize that we don't understand the meaning of certain concept or certain words, and that leads to further learning. And students, uh, most of the students will eventually get a job, hopefully, and they might be using writing in a for, in, as a way of communicating, reporting what they have done, if they make a mistake, incident report, uh, and also for record keeping. Uh, there are many different uses of writing in the workplace as well. Uh, and so are we preparing students for other classes or for future uses? The answer is probably both, uh, but we don't often conceptualize these broader goals in, a, in specific ways. For some students, academic writing proper is going to be useful if they are planning to go on to graduate school. Um, and Eventually, uh, as graduate students and faculty members, students will need to learn how to write for publication. And 
one of the problems that people encounter is that when they decide to become a go-to graduate school and become a researcher, all of a sudden they have a huge pressure to write for a publication, but they have not had much preparation beforehand. So we are, they, are, they are being asked to do a lot of learning in a very specialized and challenging context without ongoing preparation. So if we really want students to succeed, we need to start early and we need to continue to provide various forms of writing so that they can gain broad experience and feel comfortable um, facing challenging writing tasks. And beyond work, beyond academics, life happens. And we, use, we write letters, email, social media, uh, political documents, and we communicate with each, with each other and giving students the resources and experience and the confidence and the vision that help them function as productive citizens might also be an important um, larger, long, longer term goal that we have. And as a language teacher and writing teacher, my goal used to be to teach writing and language. But these days, even when I teach language and writing, that's not my goal. But my goal as a teacher is to help students become who they want to become where using language and writing might be important part of who they are and what they do. So that's a very different, broader philosophical consideration of what we do as teachers and why we do it. And I think I mentioned this yesterday as well, but uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Malaysia uh, doing a workshop. And one of the teachers came up to me and said, and she whispered actually, our students don't like writing. I don't like it either. And so I said, well, why do you think writing is difficult? And she said, it's too, it's too challenging or I don't understand certain things or I'm not confident or I make many errors, right? But there are many different reasons that we think writing is difficult. But I think we are actually making writing difficult because writing is not one thing. Writing is not always complicated. Writing is not always too challenging or unfamiliar. We make writing seem difficult by focusing only on formal academic genres in the classroom and very superficial ones at that. And the emphasis in language classrooms and writing classrooms tend to be on corrective feedback, finding what students didn't do well, and then telling them that they screwed up. And we are hoping that that might help students become better. And in some ways, yes, in the long term, they do contribute to student development. But oftentimes, corrective feedback too much too soon is only discouraging students from trying again. And oh, that's an error actually, but it's okay, I'm going to correct, self-correct it. Summative assessment is another reason that students find writing scary. Summative assessment, some of you are probably familiar with the distinction between formative assessment and summative assessment. Formative assessment is providing feedback and seeing where students are, providing feedback, and giving students a chance to improve. That is, it's a form of teaching. But summative assessment is basically testing students. So in the classroom, even in the classroom where teaching is the goal, when we assess student writing, we often just tell students what they did well and what they didn't do well. And that's all, all we do. Um, and when we focus so much on the grades or points, we are only testing students and not really teaching students. 
So how can we make it less difficult and even easy and fun? That's been my goal for the last 10 years, thinking about how can I talk about writing for teachers and students so that they don't see it as this big, scary monster but something that's manageable, something that they can learn, and something that they can enjoy and uh, feel comfortable and confident engaging. And there are uh, two major uh, approaches to making writing easy. And here's a traditional and typical response that I've seen in many classrooms. Start with the sentence level exercise. Right, writing a paragraph or writing a whole discourse is challenging. So why don't we just focus on the sentence? And well, that may be one of the activities that we can engage in. But when we start with the sentence and end with the sentence, and when we just focus on the structure of the sentence, we are actually missing the point because the sentence exists in the context of the larger string of sentences and in the discourse, in the situation, in the communicative competent, uh, context. But sentence level exercises often focus so much on the structure that we forget about the meaning, which is what writing is uh, for. And once students learn the sentence level, um, they, when, when they master the sentence level structures, they move on to the paragraph level structures. But the paragraph writing, which started to emerge in the late 1970s and became popular in the 1980s, uh, is a highly structural way of seeing writing. And when in the classroom, when teachers teach paragraphs, you know, they often start by, state by saying, start with a topic sentence, have a two or three elabor uh, elaborations. And then maybe a concluding sentence that summarizes what you have said. Um, some paragraphs look like that, but most paragraphs on, in real life, they don't look like that. Sometimes the topic sentence is at the end of the paragraph. Sometimes the topic sentence is buried in the middle. Sometimes you find the topic sentence in the previous or a previous paragraph or the next paragraph. And how much information you, you need to provide, what kind of elaboration or support, supporting information is appropriate. It doesn't come from the structural knowledge, but it comes from the knowledge of the larger textual context and social context. If we don't include that kind of information, students will never be able to write paragraphs that are actually appropriate. And the idea that the paragraph is merely a visual break, not a meaningful structural unit, uh, was already circulating in the 1980s among people who were studying paragraphs. But most of the pedagogical ideas uh, surrounding the term paragraph writing just took the initial insights about the paragraphs like a very early uh, ideas, and then they ran with it, never looked back, never continued to evolve with our better understanding of how discourse actually works. And the traditional way also tends to use repetitive tasks. If we want to help students write argumentative essays, we give them one argumentative essay after another until they become better at it. But I was just watching a video about how people tend to learn. If you are learn how to do something, and if you keep doing it over and over and over, you might get better at doing the same exact task. But are we learning anything? No, right? We learn something when we challenge ourselves, when we do something different. And then we expand our repertoire and we begin to understand the meaning of what we had learned previously. And that allows us to function better in the long run. And when we simplify writing as structures and chunks that we can learn and put together, like building blocks, like the block 
plastic block Darth Vader that you see to the right of the screen, then um, we are preparing students to produce something that's already designed by us, not to create their own meaning using the resources that they acquire. And the assessment, uh, it, because it's so structural, it's easy to just say you met this criterion and you didn't. It simplifies things for students and for us, but that's not effective teaching. Another way of making things easier and fun is to think of ourselves as artists. In art classes at the beginning, are you going to produce a masterpiece? No, right? And it's okay. The first place to begin is to learn the materials and the tools and then play with it. Make something small, make something simple. And then, you know, ha and have fun. And then if we like it, we try to attempt something a little more challenging, right? And then we keep making different things, uh, follow our in inspiration, enjoy doing it. Sometimes, you know, it's not great, but it's okay. You can put it aside and try again. And that might be a better metaphor for learning to write or learning to do anything for that matter. As I said, I teach motorcycle riding and scuba diving as well. And this principle of starting something meaningful in the real life context, um, but starting small, doing something simple, and then adding the task load gradually, that seems to help students develop much better without too much discouragement. It makes it challenging enough, but easy enough that they can actually complete the tasks. So the better way to teach writing and to make writing easy and fun is to create, start with a meaningful context rather than just giving, telling students to write five paragraphs, use 250 words, or start with a topic sentence. How about giving students a situation where writing becomes necessary? There is a guest speaker come to, coming to campus and the person is asking about the room setup. What kind of equipment do you have? How big is the room? Are the chairs movable, right? Write a response to help that speaker. Now that's a meaningful task. And even if the grammar is not perfect, even if students give a little too much information here and there or too little information here and there, the person who asked for that information will thank them for it. And then use, maybe they will ask follow-up questions, right? And that's meaningful communication. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to be meaningful and functional. And the genres that we assign can be realistic, even at the simplest level. You know, for the very beginning writers, maybe being able to write one, a single word or two words to create a phrase might be meaningful. It's a good start, right? Where do you find a meaningful and realistic genres that, looks, that uses only one or two words? How about perfume ads in magazines? Right? They might just have a beautiful image of a person or flowers or scenery. And then it might just say, uh, what would they say? You know, just fragrant or exuberant, right? And the students can have fun looking up words and trying to see if that works, if it describes the situation. And then we can also then um, ask students to create memes, short sentences or phrases that captures the meaning and sends a message, right? These are easy genres, but they are realistic genres. And also students might be familiar with these genres already. So it's in their L1 or L2. So these are more manageable tasks. And in teaching writing, especially when students are developing their competencies, it's important to let them play with language. If they make a mistake, don't punish them. 
know, recognize that, oh, okay, so you tried to say something like this, or what were you trying to say? And try to understand where they are trying to, what they are trying to accomplish, and then provide some feedback as a way of facilitating their attempts to meet those goals. Now, that's a much better way of providing feedback than just using the structural measures. You met this criterion or you didn't. And incidentally, if we punish students, if we take off points for errors, students are not going to experiment with language. There are situations, and you may have experienced this, when you provide corrective feedback and when students don't know what to do with it, instead of trying to make it better, they just take out that sentence and pretend nothing happened. I've seen that many times. Uh, I've done it too when I was lying. So assessing too early or being punitive uh, in our feedback or assessment can actually prevent students from learning. Now, this, is, this kind of insight came from the 1980s second language acquisition research. The research is pretty clear on this. But in the classroom, we only heard early messages which was developed in the 1940s and 50s, by, by the way. And we didn't really, we studied second language acquisition theories maybe, but we didn't really try to make the connections. Now is the time to start doing that. And instead of giving them a really complex writing assignment, I would start by starting with something simple and then increase the task complexity gradually. And Engagement and reflections, um, people learn by engaging and reflecting. It's not the feedback that we provide that leads to learning. It's what students do with it. So facilitating student learning by getting them to think about what's happening. Having them notice something and try to figure things out. That is the way, the best way to facilitate development. And the assessment should be formative assessment. That is, we should provide feedback with um, considering what they could, how they could make their work better or where they could be, uh, what the next step is going to be. So the emphasis of the traditional way of simplifying writing has been on performance and the structure. What I'm suggesting is to focus more on competence building and confidence building so that students can enjoy each activity, but understand how what they are learning is going to lead up to the next somewhat more challenging activities. So to recap, meaning, to create meaningful context, choose topics or writing con uh, tasks that have personal relevance. Familiar activities that tap into students' past knowledge is a good way to do this. Letting students write about something that they are interested in so that they can inquire and learn about the subject is a good strategy. Or if they already have some expertise, then let them be experts and then share those insights with other people. And if they have future aspirations, clear goals, give them writing tasks or feedback or instructions that help them reach those goals. Maintaining references to their meaningful past, present, and future experiences is key in making any writing assignment or any assignment for that matter, relevant to students. And choosing a realistic situation that students can imagine being part of is also important in making the context meaningful. And reminding students about the usefulness of what they are doing is also important. Sometimes we become complacent. Sometimes we just tell students what to do and assume that they understand why they are doing it. But that's often not the case. So reminding them, this is the objective. This is what you, I want you to notice. Here is something that I want you to learn in this lesson. That helps them focus their learning, right? And the assessment, of course, has to be based on those objectives, clear objectives. 
rather than everything that we see that's going well or not going. Realistic genres would consider situation, purpose, the subject matter, the audience, the writer's role as a writer, and a member of the community, and the medium, which is the genre, the media, uh, the venue, and the language that they use. And language play should be purpose-driven. In order to accomplish something, they try to use language, but they play with language so that they can see what happens if they change a certain words or use a different phrase. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. I wouldn't punish students for it because they tried something and they learned one way of not doing the same thing. That's learning. And provide input, show them examples to help them acquire resources, not models or templates or rules that they have to follow slavishly. And have, give them opportunities to practice by letting them write and frequently and in many different contexts. And ref encourage reflections to notice what's going on, what they could do better, what's not working, and provide feedback to affirm their learning and their efforts and to raise their awareness of what they could be doing differently or how, it, how, what, how their learning is connected to other realistic jobs. And tasks can be uh, assigned in sequence so that the first task is much easier to complete and the second task is a little more challenging, but incorporates the features from the previous tasks. So start small and then uh, start with familiar genres and point out the similarities with larger genres. As it turns out, one of the key points in transfer of learning is the recognition of similarities across different contexts and different tasks. And when we introduce uh, larger genres, uh, make sure that there are similar features or that the larger genres incorporates the features of the smaller genres. So here is an example. We can teach a one paragraph bio, short bio statement, um, which you might see on books and uh, book covers or uh, journal articles. There's bio statement for authors, right? and conference presentations, we might see those. Now that would be an easier genre and students can pretend to be a scholar or, and write their pro profile, right? 10 years from now, what kind of professor are you going to be? Let's write a profile uh, or a bio statement. And then once they learn the vocabulary, sentence structures and the genre features that are appropriate for academic bio statement, they can then try to write a profile of a scholar in academic forms, like the introduction that Thomas uh, presented at the beginning of this session, right? And because it follows some of the same features that you find in bio statements that authors write, but with from a different perspective. And, and then, um, so that's the descriptive component. And if we, you wanted to have students write comparative product reviews or a review of something, then we might start with something smaller. How about writing an online review of a restaurant or a product that they purchased, right? Um, that, those are short genres, and, but we need to use criteria that are obviously relevant uh, to the product or to the users. So that's a good start. And then summary and evaluation builds on that by adding a more thorough description of the object or um, topic that's being described uh, or evaluated, followed by the evaluation of relevant um, qualities. And once they complete that genre successfully, then they are better equipped 
to write a more complex genre of comparative product review, which involves the description of two comparable products and followed by the evaluation of the two and the synthesis where students decide, uh, argue, which one is better, right? You can see how small tasks lead up to the larger tasks in this sequencing. And in, to encourage in, engagement and reflections, I would start with self-assessment. Once a student writes something and when they submit something to me, I ask them, so what's going well? What worked out? And what didn't work out? What did you find challenging? What are you struggling with? And how can I help you? Or what do you want to do better? These questions will get them to think about what they have done and identify learning goals, which prime them for receiving feedback and incorporating feedback. And peer feedback is also useful in raising students' awareness. And many people think that peer feedback is good because students get feedback from others so that they can correct their own writing. Well, that's part of it, of course. But research shows that peer feed, the real benefit of peer feedback or more significant benefit of peer feedback is that when they provide feedback, they become more aware of how to talk about writing, how to analyze writing, how to fix things. Um, and so um, if your students don't take feedback seriously or complain that I'm giving lots of good feedback, but I'm not getting anything useful from other people, I would tell them, well, good for you, because you are actually gaining more by giving feedback. And collaborative writing works in the same way. If students truly collaborate in drafting and revising the, their documents, they, they can expand their repertoire. Because if they are writing on their own, the tendency is to use the sentence structures, vocabulary, and genre features that they already know very well, so they can succeed easily. But when they are writing with other people, other people may um, propose a different sentence structure or a different vocabulary that they've never seen. And that leads to additional learning, right? And when they disagree, and sometimes they get frustrated. I tell students that disagreement is actually good for your learning because you will have to evaluate each other's claims and then decide which one works best for that situation. And you might end up learning new words or new phrases that you never thought possible. And providing feedback and discussion, engaging in discussion, of course, uh, also enhances students' awareness. And when we pro provide feedback, instead of having students just change on the basis of our, of our feedback, we can ask students to reflect on feedback. And that leads to more thinking. And in some cases, they might say, well, you gave me this feedback, but I don't think it works, and here's why. Now, that's going to lead to significant learning, right? And critical thinking as well. And in writing classes and learning uh, language classes, sometimes students are frustrated because they don't feel like they've learned anything. And that's because when we learn language or when we learn to do things, once we can do it, we forget how, how much we struggled before. So sometimes it's nice to stop and look back and see how far we have come. One easy way of doing this is to have students write something at the beginning of the semester and collect them and then put them in an envelope and not do anything with it. And then in the mid, uh, midway through the semester or at the end of the semester, ask students to engage in some, a similar writing task. And then once they have written the second piece, return the first piece and then have them compare. They will see how much they have learned and then have them reflect on it. Now, an added benefit of this uh, activity is that students will never ever complain that they didn't learn anything in your class, in, in the teaching evaluation. 
So that's a win-win situation. And formative assessment should recognize strengths and do that at the beginning and be very specific and mean what you say. If you give superficial positive feedback, students are not going to hear it. If we give, oh, by the way, good job on this one, like that at the end, students are not going to hear it. So start with positive and make it significant. And when we are going to give critical suggestions or constructive feedback, prioritize suggestions. Don't comment on everything. And focus on what's relevant to the purpose of their communication. And focus on changes, revisions that will affect meaning. As it turns out in writing and also second language acquisition, students tend to learn better when the feedback on the structure is based on uh, meaning. That is, if changing the structure affects meaning, uh, both cognitive meaning and social meaning. And focus on learnable items. Don't provide feedback on things that students are not ready to learn. One thing at a time. And after feedback, give them a chance to practice, give them a chance to revise so that students can apply the feedback that they are getting. And finally, reward the behavior that leads to learning. And a good example of this is um, providing a preliminary uh, feedback, feedback and a grade. Sometimes students say, uh, you know, get a grade and say, oh, well, if, you, if I had more time, I could have done better. Or if I had these resources, I could have done better. And my response is, prove it. Go ahead and revise. And if you do a better job, I'll give you a better grade. And what if their revision is worse than the first draft? Would you give them a lower grade? I wouldn't because they tried. And even if they didn't succeed, they were trying to figure things, things out. And if we gave them encouraging words, nice try, and, but it actually created a different kind of problems. Now that is a really important lesson to learn. And I would let them at least keep the same grade for trying. So never ever discourage students for trying. Give them encouragement for attempting to learn because that, that way students will continue to try and continue to learn. All right, I'm going to stop here. We have about 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Matsuda. Um, I might, I must say that I like um, the way you start your presentations because you gradually take us through different perspectives that people might have had throughout history and and one goes like a, a checklist like yeah I've thought about that writing seems to be like that yeah it's true and then you you, you I, I feel so involved in in your presentations and um that's that's great because <laughs> We learn a lot with you. I have a question from Brenna Woods. Uh, she says that she has had students in her classroom that refuse to write about themselves. Um, they don't like these type of uh, assignments in, in which you have to think about familiar and personal situations. What if you have students like that? What do you recommend? Mm -hmm. Well, they don't have to write about themselves, but they can write about other people they came into contact with. You know, um, when I have students do self-introductions or, or the introductions at the beginning of class, if I ask students to stand up and talk about themselves, they don't want to talk about it because they don't want to brag or they're too embarrassed or they're not sure, okay, am I adequate, right? Um, but if I ask students to interview each other, their partners, and then introduce their partners, they feel more comfortable doing that. So try uh, having them write about other people 
that are important to them or uh, make it meaningful. Um, and because sometimes students feel like, you know, teachers ask them to write about their hobbies and they're thinking, well, you don't really care, do you? Right? And, and we don't. We're just looking for something to grade and feed, provide feedback on, right? Um, so instead, have them you know, write, you know, write about things that we, we really want to learn, right? Uh, learn about. You know, if students say, okay, this is my hobby. Wow, that's amazing. I've always wanted to do that. How do you do it? And then have them write about it. Oh, okay, let me write the instructions, right? Now that's fun and that's meaningful. That's real communication. And the audience doesn't have to be you. Does that help? Thank yeah, you. That sounds, sounds great. Uh, Mr. Joaquin Medina mentioned earlier in the chat that some teachers focus more on the grades rather than teaching to enjoy writing. And uh, that's a mistake. It's traditional teaching. It's so sad, he said. Mm -hmm. And we have Dinora Rodriguez says, Doctor, I love what you said about not discouraging students for trying. She will definitely put it into practice. I wrote in my notes in here, trying is learning, don't discourage. That's, yeah, I think we all take that message mm -hmm. very deeply because yes, we're constantly thinking it, it's a world of numbers. There are numbers and standards to get access to other programs and further preparation and, you know, career jobs and, and et cetera. So we're all focused on the numbers and we lose uh, touch. We lose the meaning of writing. We have a message from our host. Writing can serve as a form of active learning. It engages you in a process of synthesis, analysis, and evaluation of information. Well, let's see. The reflecting part when receiving feedback is such an important practice that we should all put into practice, says Stephanie Mateo. Mm -hmm. uh, we should all put that into, into practice. Carmen Reyes in YouTube says, thank you, Dr. Matsuda. Luz Borges says, greetings from Colon. We have a lot of people engaging right now, and I love this. I think providing context and real situations will definitely help students to write better papers, says Fabiola Calero. Teachers are very excited about going back into the classroom and inspiring students. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking that in preschool, students are always happy to write. And uh, I was thinking that a, a great component of that enjoyment that they have about writing is the publishing process because they know their papers are going on the wall or hanging mm -hmm. uh, around the classroom and they, they bring their parents when they pick them up and show them that that's my paper, I wrote my name, right? When do we stop publishing processes in school? Why don't we? find do you think that finding innovative ways of publishing students uh, products in different types of writing will, would help mm -hmm. yeah i think so so when students write one of the elements of realistic writing and contextualized writing is having a real audience who needs to hear the message if we are writing you know when students are sometimes asked to do research on a completely new topic and write a research paper to an audience of a teacher who is an expert, real expert. Now that's an awkward situation, right? But if they can find people who appreciate that bit of knowledge, like beginners who need to learn about something, then they don't have to be like top experts in order to be able to help, help other people. So that's what I mean by having the writer's role in the community of practice, community of fellow learners, fellow doers. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, Carmen Savalbaro says, what about first generation students? How do we prepare them for the university life? Mm -hmm. 
right? First generation students, meaning um, students whose parents did not go to universities? I, I think so, Carmen. Okay, that's my understanding of that yeah. term. Okay, yeah. So uh, if university is new, then we need to spend time introducing to the university context what the expectations are. So being more explicit about the learning objectives and the relevance of what they are learning to real life situations is going to become more important because they are less likely to, to be able to guess the significance of any activity or intentions behind them. Uh, Gloria, Gloria has her hand up. Yeah, Dr. Gloria, you are. Sorry, I have been insisting something happened to my chat box that is not getting, is not letting me type. I've been following you uh, on YouTube and I was able to, to connect. Uh, exciting. I mean, this is like touching heaven, uh, having, uh, having to hear you. And it's kind of like being face to face and you have to come for the 2025 conference. Okay, you already gave us the yes, so we want to see you then. Um, I've been, I, I it's, it, 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 the way you, you presentation flows, it's like, it gets us into, into what we want to be and do as teachers. And I've been thinking about my students and I've been thinking about this 20 years I've been teaching writing and, and trying to motivate students to write. But then I go, okay, uh, I've seen, I've seen, students struggling uh, as, they, as they want to write a two or three page essays, even if this is something about themselves. So to learn how to write as a student is challenging, but to teach them how to write, it's even more challenging, especially when we as teachers don't write. Mm. So what's your, what's your insight about this? Mm, mm, that's a really good point. Um, you know, we should practice what we preach. And if we want students to become better writers, we should also practice writing. Um, and, you know, like I said, I, when I teach motorcycle riding, you know, the motorcycle riding skills are perishable. If you don't practice often, you lose it, right? Um, and so just you know, going, going out and practicing, learning new skills constantly, upgrading your skills uh, helps you become better teachers in general. Um, so what that means is, you know, if we, um, one of the best uh, class that I've taught, uh, writing classes that I've taught, was when I actually did all the assignments with the students. And so when I created the assignment, I actually went through all the steps that I asked students to go through. And I documented what I did, how I did it, what stum uh, stumbling blocks I encountered. And I also shared my draft notes and um, used them as one, one of the examples, right? And that really resonated with students. And I, it also gave me a better understanding of uh, what problems students might encounter as they try to address um, my requirements and whether I'm being too, reason, uh, too unreasonable in asking them to do something that's really challenging. So um, I, I wouldn't be able to do it every time, but one, doing it once or twice and documenting them might help you generate better uh, teaching materials. And also it makes us more aware of what's going on. Dr. Matsuda, I, I have one final question. Okay. Um, being a publisher and, you know, an editor and having so much material out there, how do you feel about your final drafts when, when you finally publish? Um, do, do, you, do you believe in perfection or, or being fully satisfied with what you publish? Um, well, it's nice if it, it's perfect, but uh, I have found some typos or ob obvious errors, like, you know, I got formative and summative assessments uh, switched in one of the PowerPoint slides, right? That happens. Uh, and you know, don't take it too seriously. 
uh, and let it go and do better next time. And if there is a chance to change it in the second edition, take that opportunity. Right? Um, so I think in life in general, you know, a healthy attitude toward learning and performing is to take ourselves seriously enough so that we try to make it better, uh, but not take it serious, so seriously that um, we get crushed when we can't complete it or make it perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I believe that's one of the sources, main sources of procrastination, the, the high pressure that we put on ourselves. And we don't think about a first draft. It, we always have to think it, it's the first draft. Just let it out and then you keep polishing. Mm -hmm. right? I, I tell my students that because not even the final draft will be fully, completely satisfying because you will always try to right, improve. And, and that, um, that willpower and that desire to improve is what we aim for. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Dr. Matsuda, for this lovely presentation. So enriching. We all take notes back home and back to the classroom. And it's a great honor to have you in any learning. The honor is mine. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you all in our next session. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for attending our conference.